Right. Welcome back, everybody. So we are about to start our, I think this is maybe our 14th meeting of the Policy and Practice Subcommittee of the GAP Act. Um, so welcome, everybody. And I uh, just wanted to um, do a quick roll call here. We have some folks here, but there might be others joining in later. I certainly wanted to be sensitive to your time. Um, and so... Also, I don't see any um, public attendees here, so I'll keep an eye out for that. If we do, then we'll make sure that they know uh, kind of the rule, the, the rules of the game. So with that, for the, let me see who we have here. So I'm gonna see, and, and thank you, Stefan, I see you're checking. We got Luke, uh, Richard, we have Nicole, Antonio, Mark. Here. And we have Jenny. Let's see. And then we'll see Here. if we have a, other folks joining in a bit later. But uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and I was just saying uh, to the group, had a really solid week here of getting more information on the things that the committee could be working with the uh, acquisition workforce and the industry partnership it usually takes us about a week to post the videos to going through the internal clearance within GSA. Uh, those will be good videos to watch once we put those out there, uh, and then we can definitely get a send out a flag on that. Um, for today's meeting, I'm going to turn it over to look pretty quickly here, but we're going to be mostly doing a working meeting. I uh, didn't have any invited speakers for this particular one, but uh, I will turn it over to look at this time. Take us from here. Great, thank you, Boris. Uh, as you indicated, uh, the plan is to make this a, a working meeting uh, so that we can kind of share where we are on uh, our various recommendations. Um, there are two recommendations that we won't get to today. Uh, there, Amlon has put together a, a fairly detailed white paper, which I've, I've shared uh, with this group. Uh, and I encourage you and and everyone really to take a good look at it. There's some great concepts in there. I'd, I don't think it's fair to discuss it without him, unfortunately. Um, but he, he has been working on this uh, alone. Um, and kind of, I think, Nicole, he said he may have communicated with you a few times, uh, perhaps to make sure we weren't overlapping uh, efforts. Um, but I, I do... I do think it's worth uh, taking a look at and having folks uh, opine uh, what I in what I think will be a another administrative meeting. Um, so this is the this is the run up to our our December fifth uh, recommendation meeting. Is that is that right, Boris? December fifth. Right, December fifth. Uh, we will be putting out a federal register notice. So we're we're going through the clearance process right now to post that. Um, and then as soon as that goes out, then we can do broader um, outreach and, and getting some people. So we have some good things planned. I uh, have a speaker from HP <clears throat> that's going to talk about their sustainability program and, and tell their story from, from, the, from their corporate. And, uh, and then mostly presentations from the subcommittees and discussion. So. That's the and plan. Boris, that's a three and a half hour meeting, right? It will be, yes, uh, 1 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Mm -hmm. Great. So this being our last public meeting between now, between now and then, um, that's, that's kind of, that was the intent of making this a working meeting. But I do think that the task groups will continue to meet and should continue to meet. Perhaps we should get on a, a weekly cadence to check in just to make sure where working towards some goal on uh, for December 5th. Um, and of course there's Thanksgiving in the middle there that's gonna throw a wrench into everybody's availability. So I think that's the expectation I'll set. And maybe when we, when we break later, we can figure out what time the task groups are available on a weekly basis. So we're at least checking in and making sure that things are, are moving. Um, we had also discussed uh, adding a, an administrative meeting uh, I think the date we came we came up with was November ninth. Uh, no, November ninth, correct. November ninth. Right. So we mm -hmm. we would do it during this during this time slot, and that would be probably our our last kind of group check in before we uh, finalize our recommendations and get them ready for for December fifth. 
So that's, I think, the cadence over the next uh, the next couple of weeks. Um, with that, uh, and since we do have a small group here, and there has been a lot of activity both at the federal level and on the other committees, I do want to ask and invite anybody to share uh, anything they want to, uh, news, uh, reports from the other uh, subcommittees, um, give, you know, Nicole or Jenny or Antonio, um, Richard, is there anything that you think you'd want to share that might be relevant for this subcommittee today? I'm happy to jump in with an, an update Great. of what we heard this week. This week was, um, it was really, really fantastic to hear about what was ha what is happening within IRS and Department of Treasury around the technologies that they're, they're using to accelerate and embed sustainability into the procurement process. They're using artificial intelligence and a suite of other technologies. They're absolutely pushing the envelope within the space. And I think we have much to learn. David Gill, who spoke with us um, for the public meeting, indicated that he's developing a series of white papers based on his learnings from uh, from Treasury and IRS, how it might facilitate activities within GSA and across the federal government more broadly, because he's not just uh, executing these technologies, he's, he's actually taken off the shelf technologies and has bent them for use within his particular agency. So I think it's a really, really interesting perspective that's informing some of the work that we're doing now. Um, I was really excited to see Amlon's um, summary. There is some overlap between this. I think we just need to have a conversation. I haven't heard from him since the end of September when I emailed him after our conversations about the, um, the FAR Council uh, recommendations. Um, so it's great to see that the conversation is moving forward, but definitely based on what I saw, he and I should connect. Great. That's great. Uh, does anyone else have any news they'd like to share? Okay, great. Uh, then let's get let's get right into it, uh, and we'll we'll start with the the stars uh, our stars so far uh, the PFAS recommendation. Uh, uh, Jenny or Richard, uh, do either of you want to kind of talk through where we are, uh, what we're thinking, and 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 where we might want to get some input? Well, I've been a bit out of the loop now for four, almost four weeks uh, traveling through Europe. Um, but last I'd understood, uh, we were looking at an echo labeling approach uh, around PFAS. Yeah, and I will say that I'm quite jealous of that schedule. That's, <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Um, but for the for that task group, our task force, we um, looking at uh, just really outlining the the options for GSA uh, that some of that includes you know, information collection on, on where our companies at um, you know, so saying looking at eco labels and standards as as uh, one way to get there but recognizing that if it's not in place what are the actions that can be taken uh, leading up to that as well and providing a little bit of that that landscape. So still needs to be fleshed out a bit more. So I think we need to have a, another another meeting. But uh, David, I know, did quite a bit of work in um, providing some of the background in that document. So, um, so I think we just need to spend a little more time uh, on it. But welcome back. Um, well, my recollection is, I mean, David was talking about the scope of what a PFAS echo label might look like, particularly given the complexities around the chemistry associated with it, and also the significant overlap around other initiatives around PFAS in, in other avenues and venues going forward. There, there are a number of other uh, related, but in specific industry sectors, as I understand it. And so kind of getting our arms around how the process would work. I'm a procurement guy. I, I fully understand how a procurement mandate would be structured uh, and what a FAR provision might look like that would implement it. 
But the question is, what is the it that would be implemented? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think in the in the memo that we're that GS, the task force is working on now, I think it outlines the possible its and 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 how realistic they are um, and and time frames and then what would need to be done to make them more realistic. But but it is a, a tough a tough question. Yeah, yeah, does anybody else have any, I mean, thoughts, input? Has anyone had a chance to take a look at what's what's been done already? Hey, hey look, and I can add a little bit. I sat yep, in on the please. task group meetings. Um, so Rich, for your input too, we've been talking to GSA folks like Adina and some of the other people within GSA about this topic and, and what they have to offer. So we, we picked up some other input. Uh, Federal wow. Acquisition Service, FAST, which oversees the uh, GSA Advantage uh, Green Products Compilation, also has been doing some updates to their tools to identify, for example, what is um, PFAS, uh, addresses PFAS. So they've been playing with the, uh, the systems as well uh, to begin to address uh, at least the low hanging fruit. So that so we've been coordinating with GSA internally as well. So that whatever is delivered will be consistent with uh, some of the ways they're thinking, in addition to you know other ideas, as Jenny said. So they think, think of it like the single-use plastics was a really good formula where you had different topics that address, and then that was able to spark some initiatives within GSA. And so I think taking that same approach here would be really helpful. Um, but, but yeah, so that's, that's the other piece I wanted to add here. And then also, like, uh, like Jenny said, there is other initiatives like DOD has done some work on the end. So we're looking at DOD's work in this space. Um, JAO has some reports. So there, there's a ton of things out there. So we're making sure that this will acknowledge uh, those other bodies of work out there. So it's well coordinated. Well, when we first started this discussion, I had not being a, a, a chemist this naive perception that PFAS was a specific chemical formula uh, mm -hmm. that was applied uh, you know, to different types of products and services across the industry, and, and that all you had to do was identify um, the, the, the uh, uh, chemical formulation and seek to reduce its applicability regardless of industry sec sector, but it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. Oh, yeah. Uh, both yeah. in terms of the, of the science and the chemistry, as well as how it's utilized and deployed. So um, it, uh, um, my, I mean, my hope would be that we could still find some commonality across various industries, applications, products, and utilizations for this, whatever this is. But uh, uh, it's not even clear that it's a, sing a single family of, of, of chemistry or multiple families or hybrids and offshoots and that's what I don't understand right now. And if David added information or his draft in the document. Um, but for us, yeah. I know that there are two, there are two documents in the file. Uh, I think yeah, we should probably delete the yeah. non-operative one just so that we don't get yeah, multiple I'll, files yeah. happening at once. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go in and make sure that we have the one that the latest, so we're all on the same, on the same sheet. Yep. Great. Yeah. Thank but, you. Yeah, pre appreciate a lot of work on that. I think that's coming together nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, David has done a lot of work. He just wasn't able to join today. I think he's traveling. Yes, unfortunately. Right yeah. Yep. Um. Okay. Uh, is there anything we are looking for input-wise from this group? Um, I think our figuring out and fleshing out the draft over the next couple of weeks is is very doable, right? And I think maybe by uh, the November 9th meeting, we should be able to present what would be a draft recommendation. Does that sound doable, Richard, Jenny? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, setting up the procurement framework is, is I won't say trivial, but I mean, you know, we, we have the single use plastics framework. I, I, I can draft, I can draft far language in half an hour that, that accomplishes this. So that's the, that's the, the least of it. 
it's figuring out how, how how to define the echo label in a way that makes sense, works practically in the um, and doesn't hog tie eleven o twos and and procurement folks uh, and time up in knots with complexity. So, to me, that's that's the that's the uh, major challenge here. And we've got until November 9th to solve it. So that's a challenge, challenge issued, challenge issued. Um, and, I, and I think with, it also overlaps a little bit with Nicole's group as far as the tech tools for, or as far as the, the tools that would be used maybe um, for the GSA is putting together. Um, but we will, or was it? It, what is I your think, group called again, Nigel? Sorry. I think it's, it's the data, the data piece that oh, you're focusing on. Standardization. Because yeah. Yeah, yeah, the data is, it's, I mean, data is a niche across the board, but I think genuine, when we were talking, that was one yeah. of the things that came up. And I think that's a nice tie into mm -hmm. what Nicole's yeah. group is working on. Ginny, after next week, I would be in a position to float some draft language that we're putting together on the data front okay. if so that we can make sure then that whatever you're putting forward is congruent or at least tips your hat to, mm -hmm. to the complexities that you all are dealing with, or, or conversely, we're happy to provide that as an example within our own recommendation too. It's mm -hmm. totally up to you all, whatever makes sense. Right, and I think GSA is work, you know, working on a, a potential tool there with the data for where there are existing eco labels available, which is in you know a limited space, but at right. least is, is something. Um, right, it's a place so to start. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think there's some overlap uh, there potentially. So, okay. So, um, I, I just want to add. I'm still a little bit foggy on exactly how we get there. Um, trying to do a, just a basic comparison is what we're talking about similar I, I know we talked about the um using the energy label i'm gonna use one another example is it similar to what we see in our nutritional packaging on food where you can see percentage of sodium are we suggesting that there'll be a way that we could capture the pfas quantity or impact whatever way way you state that in such a way that it would be as, as easy as looking to say this one is loaded with a lot or it's not loaded with a lot but based on whatever range of uh, particles or however that's de determined. And then if if that is sort of what this is, how does that determination get made and who affirms that whatever is on the label is accurate to what's really in the product, if you will? Well, I think our proposal went beyond just a mandatory disclosure requirement or a list of ingredients. Um, that That is a, a well-known approach. For example, for software, you have a thing called a software bill of materials requirement mm -hmm. now uh, going forward uh, uh, for federal cybersecurity purposes. And basically, um, it's a mandate that for, for you to sell software uh, to, to, the, to the government, you have to disclose the content of the software through that approach. Mm -hmm. Um, that's certainly one one aspect of it that could be utilized. What we had in mind, I think, was to was to create an echo label that had an outright ban that said if the product or mm -hmm. the product slash service had this chemical component in it, the government couldn't buy it. Okay, just period. Gotcha. Period. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's what we've been talking about anyway. And there's precedent uh, for that. So yeah. No, that's not quite the approach. You know, wearing my own EPA hat, that's not quite the approach to the EPA recommend but um, we'll see kind of where the task force shakes out but as far as what EPA has been looking at is looking at something like the the safer choice label which I have behind me here on the shelf and that is a label that that address that doesn't allow for intentionally added PFAS at all um, and so that addresses PFAS so you know that could, is something that could be used in in filtering out saying you can only buy cleaning products that that are certified with um, with this label or there's another label certain uh, certain uh, green seal labels also address you fast and so uh, GSA is 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 trying to incorporate that into some 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 tools um, and I, this is a public meeting so I'm not sure how far along um, you are <laughs> but um, 
Uh, so I think not, but not necessarily at, at EPA, at EPA were not supportive of creating a standalone PFAS free label, just given and rather incorporating it into multi-use or multi-attribute labels like this or labels that address other chemicals as well. That way you don't have, you know, 20 different labels that you're trying to require for procurement mm -hmm. officers. And so that makes it even, even more difficult. Uh, but I think in, in the memo that, that, that the task force is working on, we don't necessarily have to come up with exactly the answer, but some, but some options and maybe some ranking of, of what those options look like. But we should have, have another administrative talk um, when we can. Well, yeah. I mean, you could structure it all the way from an outright ban to making or making it a procurement preference, mm -hmm. roll it up into the evaluation criteria in section M. There's a, there's a range of mm -hmm. ramifications that you could do. I, I being a, being a simple minded individual, I mean, the EU has a whole list of chemicals that are just banned outright um, from, uh, from products and, and, and the like. Um, and so I was being simplistic in my thinking perhaps that, that this this would be of a similar uh, structure as the as the way the European Union uh, goes about it. Of course Jenny knows way more about this than I do but well procure yeah there's a whole whole lot of things going to that but I think from this procurement GSA standpoint, I think just listing out what the what the breadth of options are here and kind of challenges with mm -hmm. with each I think is gets them um, gets GSA down the road and I think is what they're looking for um so I think we think the task force has a has a start on that uh, for sure and sounds like Rich we should um I think there are a couple parts of that where your your uh what you were just talking about there would be good to maybe just um, plug in a bit more so maybe we can set that up with Luke and yeah yeah let's let's aim to get together uh early next week um and just kind of kind of sort through some of these um terrific you have the real procurement shops yeah <laughs> yeah the procurement ringer and and I think when we have you know other stakeholders who are not in the room today who will also take different angles and give us different perspectives like i i think the 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 quicker we can get it in front of the larger group the more you know the more angles we'll see so I, definitely let's let's link up early next week um and figure out how to uh how to get something as close to final as possible by november 9th so that our, the rest of the group can poach you know punch holes in it um any additional thoughts on this one any final thoughts? Um, so the the only other uh, percolating recommendation that we were going to be able to talk about today, due to folks not being here, is our is less of a recommendation and more of a turning into a bit of a, a survey of observation and observations and concepts. Um, Boris, I, I I'm perfectly okay with you pulling up that. Uh, the version of the concepts okay. we've identified, we can sure. just rattle through them. And I think, so we've had a number of uh, out, outreach and conversations with uh, state entities and uh, some kind of uh, industry folks. And there have, there have been some concepts that have come up and we, we tried to put them into uh, writing um, what, I, what we're unable to identify and what hopefully maybe we can talk through today is put it put it put some of this through the shark tank treatment and you know let us know if it makes any sense if it's crazy if it doesn't belong here uh but i don't think uh i think the goal for december 5th with this exercise is to put concepts in front of the gsa if it's easy to recommend that the GSA does it, that's great. But otherwise, I think some of this are just concepts and observations that we want to, you know, we can advise the GSA are taking place uh, and get their feedback feedback on whether it's something they want us to look into further, if they would like to hear a recommendation related to it. Um, but it, it, you know, 
there's there's a lot. We've only scratched the surface. We've only had a few meetings, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So it it's um it's a Herculean exercise, and and hopefully we'll be able to pull a couple of uh, of good recommendations from the exercise at some point. So the first concept here is extended producer responsibility, and you know you guys know I'm one of the procurement people on this on this committee. So is there somebody here that maybe can explain this in layman's terms for those of us that are not experts in extended producer responsibility? I'm looking at my uh, Nicole, maybe. Well, I, I'm, I'm, look at it. I'm like certainly Jenny can certainly <laughs> because this is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So is, can, is, is, do I have any volunteers to explain it to the rest of us before I pitch it? I think it's just a simple recognition that if you produce it, you own it. You have to manage it. You don't pass it on to the consumer or anyone else beyond the boundaries of your organization. If you're putting together something that um, that has a lot of toxic chemicals or has huge impacts to the environment, then you will be responsible. That organization will be responsible with managing it. But that's in very casual terms. I think Jenny is going to offer. I'm, I'm hoping. I saw you come off come off the off uh, mute. Do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I think I think that we could leave it at at that. Just broad stroke there great um but it's a concept that's definitely been uh pace has been picking up especially at the state level in the last few years and but, so but i don't think it's right for me to uh, comment too much on it here I, I see here an important point that you've added and that relates to incentives you know what do those incentives look like they often relate to sticks <laughs> right so I, I so we did have a, a conversation with uh, I, I forget the name of the organization, but they're they're one of the advocates for this, or, or actually a company that acts as a a go between for uh, the industry and kind of the legislative efforts to make sure that they're in sync with each other. Um, and it seems to be this seems to be something that's that's legis really legislatively done. At the at the state level, and all states kind of have different categories that they've uh, addressed or sought to address, probably based on their own kind of consumption studies. I mean, for you know, for me in New York here, I I know that my propane tank when it when it runs out of propane, the the company has got to take it back. You know, that cost is not the cost of disposal. The problems of disposing of a of a of a propane tank are not pushed onto me, the consumer, or my municipality, who would have a high cost of trying to dispose of something like that, or like re refrigerants or electronics, um, you know, so, some of these things. And so I think the concept to me is is really if you, when you put that responsibility with the manufacturer, it incentivizes them to manufacture things that require less cost, less trouble, less chemicals, less waste in the end, because they have to shoulder that cost, right? And so there is perhaps some sort of embedded incentive in in, in their behavior or in their manufacturing choices when they have to assume the cost of disposal. And so th this is not, I, this isn't something that necessarily came up as a procurement tool, but I, I know that we, I have been involved in at least one procurement where we have done this contractually. We, we purchased a piece of equipment that we knew would be very difficult to dispose of at the end of life and uh was just it was complicated to the point where it was going it was going to be expensive there was no resale value there was nowhere we could get rid of it on the uh, we couldn't put it up for surplus sale and so rather than shoulder that cost we built into the contract that the manufacturer whomever it was uh that sold it to us would then have to uh, be responsible for its disposal at the, at the end of life. And so that's it, it, you know, I, I'm just putting it out there. I don't know if this is wild or crazy or ridiculous or something that GSA might, might, you know, find useful. Um, but that's, I think where you guys can come in and let me know, is this something we should even mention? Is it, is it too fraught with issues that may be, you know, 
that I, we're, we're not aware of and didn't come up in our conversation? Uh, or is there some sort of utility where this concept can come in and, and play a role in, in some sort of recommendation? Really just looking for your thoughts. Silence. I mean, my take is yes, of course. I, I, what I don't understand is the practicalities associated with this. And, and I think that's where the rubber meets the road for a, a lot of these ideas. Um, you know, how practically could it take effect within the organization? And, uh, and I'd like to hear information about that. I'd like to hear, you know, how, how that has looked practically. Um, but conceptually, Luke, of course, this is the direction we should be going. I'll, I'll chime in, Luke. Um, I, I know we had a presenter for printer cartridges, and they were pretty ahead of the game in terms of what they do and how they refurbish the cart cartridges. And I think that's just one example. And when I think, think of things like those small uh, handheld propane tanks that go on things like lanterns and stoves, you can't recycle them. Uh, they will not take them. They're explosive. So now, now what do you do? Well, you toss it in the garbage with the rest of everything else. It just seems like a total waste. And I know that a lot of the state contracts that we had, we would build in some obligation to take the packaging. And if you're going to through that, go, go through that effort, as you point out, there's an internal cost. So now you have to calculate, well, is it really worth going through all that trouble or is there some other way to make it? Uh, or can we streamline the whole process somehow? So I, I like the concept, but as Nicole points out, you know, there's a cost and there's a practicality of side of the whole thing, and that needs to be totally vetted. So yes, I like the concept, but how to implement, that's a big issue. I mean, one of the cool things about this is it encourages innovation from the vendor side, innovation that may never, never otherwise get traction. Because if all of a sudden you have to take back these pro, the mini propane tanks, you know, for camping, they have to think differently about their business model. Uh, I'd be eager to learn how different, different um, product categories have managed these issues, what that's looked like. Good. I like that. Jenny, were you going to say something? Yeah, yep. I'm cautious about just not you know, commenting on legislation given my position, but I'm um, just looking at, you know, potential for GSA here and just thinking about what, I don't know if we have this for us as far as what GSA spends money on, but I'd imagine that there's a lot of, a lot of carpet, a lot of various things, but getting right. to know like where, um, where that could be particularly impactful, but I think Luke, it's a good, good thing to be thinking about a product. How can you incentivize companies to, to be, um, to look at this more of a stewardship model through, through these larger potential contracts. Yeah. Jenny, I think we can get a hold of some of the spend data through the category management programs. Um, we did have uh, their leadership come and talk to us a couple of months ago, it seems. But that might be a source of data on, you know, the span, that kind of thing. Span right. analysis. I um, I worked on a uh, product line that that uh, embodied or encompassed full uh, full life cycle uh, recycling and uh, uh, extended producer responsibility in the context of solar panels. This manufacturer was using. Uh, a new formulation for solar panels called cadmium telluride. CADTEL is a, a banned carcinogen in the EU and, and elsewhere. And so for them to enter into uh, global markets, they came up with a closed circuit, closed loop recycling program that took the old panels back to, the, to their factory using a proprietary chemical process to extract the carcinogen uh, and put it back into production. Uh, closed cycle with a... Uh, uh, a perpetual bond, or uh, in other words, they put, they put up enough money to ensure that this would uh, occur in perpetuity, uh, and that was an essential aspect for them to obtain legislative and marketing uh, approvals to sell those solar panels in, in the European Union. 
the company's called First Solar, and then they turned it into a big marketing, um, uh, 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 what's the word, plus. So big, uh, they baked it into, into their core marketing materials uh, to show their green bona fides. So it was an interesting approach, uh, close circuit. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. That seems to be the kind of behavior we should be incent we can incentivize with something like this. That's really, really neat. Great example, Richard. If you just go on the first solar website, you can, I mean, they they tout the hell out of it now. So they they really, you know. I just want to give a shout out, another Arizona company. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the factory's in excellent. Ohio, though. <laughs> I have I've had student projects with them. They're great. <laughs> Excellent. All right, that's good news. Okay, so I'll put this one as a cautious yellow. It won't come off the list yet. Let's go to number two. Uh, I think this one's coming off the list only because I I think I, I just figured out and found that the GSA has an equivalent program that already exists. Uh, so this is really the concept of asset of of what do we do with assets? Do we dispose of them? Do we recycle them? Do we do we have a kind of a governance structure where when an asset reaches is not useful for a, a, a department, uh, a, a, some some part of the organization? Do we have a system to figure out if there's any utility for it elsewhere while there's still life to it? Uh, and if not, you know, what's the what what's the next step? Then do we go to public with a surplus sale? And then what? So we really just trying to extend the full the full life of any particular asset so that we're not there is no waste and we're extracting every, you know, every potential use out of it. So I actually got a, a I figured out or, or was put on, you know, was put onto a, a program that exists. Stephanie Boris, maybe you can confirm that this uh, personal property management system, and which is, yeah, it does. It does. It seems to yeah. do exactly what we, what we observed and made and, you yeah. know, and serve that purpose. They, they, they do have a very mature, uh, actually very active uh, excess property program uh, and very, very well uh, resourced and managed. So this this is something GSA does very well. Uh, and I talked to the gentleman in our team within Office of Government Wide Policy who's doing some interesting things here. We talked early on about maybe possibilities of uh, doing some work with them but but the the short answer is yes this is a really well run very mature program uh, for gsa they, they've Good. done a ton of work on this and they're they're really uh, taking the lead role uh, where other agencies are really benefiting from this and i don't so know Stephen, I, if you had anything yeah, else and to I, add on the, I mean on the excess only, property oh i'm my only add it uh, is this is really, it's more than just the personal property management system, right? This really this really is the kind of sustainable infrastructure a company should have. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking about rebranding our own internal system here so that folks see it for what it is, which is not just this internal kind of like message board where we figure out what to do with property, but this is like, it's fostering sustainability within the organization. Right. Stephanie, sorry, were you gonna say something? No, I, I didn't have anything, Luke. Great. Luke, I, have, yeah. I, I wonder about this. Have, have you engaged in, with folks in GSA about this? Because what I'm asking myself is, do they see opportunities on the horizon that are yet unrealized? It's a good question. No, I no, I didn't. This is purely independent research. So yeah, yeah. you're right. Maybe a conversation with the people behind the program. And I can there may be more we can do with it. Yeah, I can make the connection with that. There are some of our colleagues in the Office of Government Wide Policy, um, actually. So, awesome. Yeah, that's good. That's great. I would love to have that conversation. And anyone else who wants to join. Uh, all right, let's go to number three. So, the really this concept of of green specifications is something we heard both from, from New York, uh, Minnesota, Massachusetts. Their green specifications are listed on the website. Uh, in some cases, they refer to eco-labels or third-party certifications for certain categories. And in others, they, they provide much more detailed specifications that are 
kind of independently drafted and differ from state to state. Um, and I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know if or when or how the GSA could potentially play a role in here, but my procurement mind is running to, you know, why should there be a different green specification for uh, air purifiers between New York and Massachusetts and potentially the GSA? Why shouldn't, you know, how can we set a standard and, and let everybody follow? And we, we kind of heard that. Right. We heard that from from at least one, if not if not two states. That they're going through this exercise, but it would be great if they had the GSA to model after or to follow. And so, uh, you know, this to me seems to be where a lot of the states are going is their own independent drafting exercises to, that are, you know, uh, it, driven usually legislatively. Uh, or by executive order, but what, you know, is there a role for the GSA here? Um, what do we think? I won't speak to this directly, but I'll speak to parallel conversations that we've been having in, in the Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee that um, related to the data standardization, we were hearing from other agencies that one of the, everyone wants good data, but no one's taking the lead. And so inevitably there's a lot of inefficiency that's created across these agencies as they wrestle with the issue on their own. That's on the agency side. Simultaneously, we heard from vendors that said, they're trying to create their own data and centralize their data so that they can make sense of what's happening. And that was just from a couple of vendors. So then you generalize across this whole, the whole landscape. It's a lot of resources and a lot of time when inevitably different organizations are replicating the work of the other organizations in front of them. I mean, I think at the heart of what you're asking here, Luke, is through the centralization, are there spillover benefits that could be gained more broadly? And I think inherently the answer is yes. The question becomes who's the convener for this and, and who should be advancing it? That is not a question I can answer. <laughs> a great question. I nominate Boris and Stephanie. <laughs> no, but then. Go ahead, no, Laura. I do think the data um, recommendation takes a nice stab at, at this, though. And I think it's, it's sort of a start for the federal level. Uh, and I think we can learn. I mean, just talking to these three states that are really at the forefront, um, just highlighted. And this, these are folks that are really thinking about this very seriously, highlights how much of an opportunity this is. But I do think, Nicole, that the data work that you all are doing will, will be a start right. in going into and this direction. I will say that even maybe a, like looking at the landscape of maybe where is this, where is this particularly needed? Um, and I will say that for my own program with lower, lower carbon concrete, it's one of the things listed there and EPA is charged with with creating a label specific to that. And we do have funding under the Inflation Reduction Act. So um, that's something where there is federal leadership, although it's, you know, it, it's still in the beginning of the implementation part there, but I think that's something to put the federal leadership on rather than having states all have well doing their own thing, uh, really getting the uh, a federal label kind of similar to what Energy Star has uh, there. But but also looking at what are other, what are all the other SPLC and others doing in this space too. That's a great example, Jenny. Thank you for bringing that up. I mean, that's, that's I know my own agency uh, just released their lower carbon concrete spec. New York State mm -hmm. released one and it's, they're, they're not the same. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they're very close, but uh, a federal standard for that or a label, low carbon concrete. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's I think that's very that's exactly the kind of thing that I think 
I would I would like to see come out of something like this. Right. And that um, is that's in the works. And I think that our program we need to do, we just got a notice of funding opportunity out for a hundred million dollars um, for for that to start to build that the data and systems and everything behind the BPDs, but also need to make sure to be talking to to states and the private sector to um, make sure that everyone, everyone knows that that is underway so that um, they can have something to to rely on and plan on versus continuing to um, spend lots of time and energy on creating these individual programs. Not that they have to, but <laughs> have the opportunity to rely on them. Got it. Okay, so we'll, we'll mark this as a cautious yellow for now. Uh, let's go to number four. So concept vendor affirmation as to past practices and their supply chains. So there is no precedent for this yet, but we were advised that there is a, a, a law um, being contemplated in New York, uh, which would require companies contracting with the state that to certify or to do to affirm that they do not contribute to tropical or boreal intact forest degradation or deforestation directly or through their supply chains. So um, it's I I guess I'm uh, what piqued my interest more is the concept of a vendor affirmation as to practices, uh, whether it's deforestation or or something else. This is a tool that I mean it's very common in in our own contracts too in my agency right I, I by submitting a bid I hereby affirm that I have never been indicted I've never been convicted I've never lobbied etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. so you're 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 ensuring a, a responsible counterparty by creating kind of a, a a structure of affirmations that are you know meant to kind of ensure we're doing business with the type of firms that we you know, think are responsive and responsible. And so I, I'm not sure if the GSA has a tool like this, but it is it is something that I think is interesting if we could if we if we did have some sort of behavior we wanted them to affirm or certify to. Deforestation just being one night that's out there that doesn't seem to have gotten any teeth yet. Is there an equivalent to that? Is it like an affirmation from folks we do business with? I'm sure there's a no lobbying provision somewhere, but what what other kind of affirmations do we look for? So, so Luke, the GSA does have uh, those types of affirmation in their solicitation and contracting clauses. Um, initially, right up front, like you just stated, you know that you know you're not a lobbyist or you haven't been, you know. Uh, to jail or things like that, but also that you're not using uh, prohibited products or, you know, or you're not getting things from prohibited sources. And so they do have those types of clauses and provisions um, in their solicitations um, as well. But I think what's, I think what's interesting to me about this is this takes a leap from, I think, our standard or what I think is the standard where the affirmations relate to integrity and really criminal related stuff to almost ESG criteria, right? And that's that is a that seems to be a big leap. I'm not sure anybody has done that yet that way, but uh, as a concept, I I like it. I just don't know that we could ever agree uh, on exactly what we would want people to affirm uh, in this context, at least related to ESG related stuff. I don't know. I wonder, um, because it's my understanding that the proposed FAR rule requires, so it's more than an affirmation, it's an indication that they've actually put together a climate action plan, right? A plan to mitigate their their carbon impacts and, and whether that's like a point on the pathway of uh, that you're on right now, Luke. So that's related specifically to carbon and that's uh, a little bit more tangible because you you need to indicate specifically that you have a plan. And of course, the next question is, and 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 I guess I don't know, do they, as part of the proposed FAR, do they have to submit the plan? I, I'm asking those who have deeper knowledge about, about the way this, the revisions are set up. 
So, so normally when, when plans like that are requested it, and it's in the solicitation, you do have to submit those plans with your proposal. Okay. Um, and sometimes it can be at different stages of the um, solicitation process, but you have to have submitted this, it has to be submitted before award, right? Um, really depends on how the requirement is written. So I think that's a data point, certainly on the same pathway that you're on here, Luke. Okay, yeah, that's a good, that's a great example. Okay, uh, another cautious yellow. Uh, let's go to number five, uh, capacity building, technical assistance. I mean, I think this is a recurring theme, right? We're, we're not, whatever we do, whatever the GSA does is, is we don't want to create more barriers to entry to small certified EBEs. Um, and so I think softening that transition uh, is something we just need to keep, you know, uh, we've heard folks on this committee say it, we can't forget it. Uh, the fact that there's now, you know, at least one precedent, you know, point to precedent, and I'm sure there are many more, but this was the only one we heard of where, you know, if a city or a municipality is going to start requiring lead, uh, you have to bring your vendor community up to up to speed on what that is, what's required, how they can contribute to it, what role they can play, uh, give them the technical assistance so that they can build the capacity to meet those those new requirements, right? And to me, that works. It's no different from a small uh, a small firm that sells widgets. If we're going to start requiring uh, PFAS free widgets, we have to educate those vendors on what PFAS free is or what set for choice is or what other equal labels are so that they can transition to a, you know, uh, being a provider of those items. Um, so I don't, I think this is less of a recommendation, but more of a, we need to keep this in mind, no matter what we do. Um, but it was good to hear that, that, that this, that the, the issue had been acknowledged and it had been solved kind of with a, a technical assistance training training program for at least one vendor community. Hey, Luke, and I can I can speak a little. I don't know if anybody from the industry partnerships subcommittee here right now, but I can talk a little bit about the conversations in this space uh, because it has come up quite a bit, actually, within the industry partnerships. And uh, one of the, uh, there is no recommendation right now that addresses this directly, but we are looking at things like partnerships between a large and small business, sort of mentoring uh, small business and things of that sort. Um, and, and it is a, so something we heard yesterday during the uh, discussion on the lighthouse. So we have a, a lady that came and spoke about an organization that they just stood up a nonprofit to promote growth for black talent and small uh, black owned small businesses uh, in the architecture, engineering, construction uh, area. And it was about being cautious of any requirements we put in, how does that affect the, the opportunities for new firms to come in? So it's something we talked about. I don't know that we necessarily had something, you know, to put down as a recommendation in this area, but that's definitely has come up considerably. Good. Nicole? Yeah, I, as, as conversations about technical assistance has been moving forward and, and um, pulling up small vendors, I, I have on many occasions thought back to the work that EPA is doing around technical assistance and P2 grants and asking myself, is there an opportunity for GSA to do something similar with a different focus? What I don't understand is sort of the regulatory setup for how EPA has moved these opportunities forward. And, and I view them in two buckets. One is like collaboration with industry to learn how to make this process easier um, and more, um, more diffused. How do you diffuse knowledge across multiple communities? But also um, 
just within, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about just like um, research on procurement processes and the opportunities that exist within the procurement processes themselves. So two different sorts of communities, but both involve research of some form or another. If, if GSA truly wants to take leadership within within this space, it seems that they should be creating opportunities to bring cutting edge knowledge right back into the organization. And there aren't mechanisms for that. EPA has uh, tried to create these mechanisms. Historically, they even had grants that studied corporate responsibility within organizations themselves and uh, uh, to work within universities to think through how that could happen. But I have asked myself multiple times during the last year about how, how the agency may be able to curate knowledge and to seed um, opportunities to develop that knowledge through pilots that may or may not exist specifically within GSA, but there may be a targeted area where they wanna curate that knowledge and uh, letting other organizations develop that may be a mechanism to really begin addressing these issues. Great point, uh, Nicole. I don't know if Stephanie or, or Boris have a thought. Yeah, I was I was just sitting here thinking about um, AP Tech. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with that. It's the Association of uh, Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it, it used to be under uh, DLA, and I know now it's under DOD. Um, and they do this very thing. If small businesses actually reach out to them, they will actually help them through the process to some degree. Um, and I'm just looking and wondering um, about, and, and they have sponsors as well, as far as like major sponsors, companies, industries that work with them as well. So I was just wondering if this was an area that, uh, could be explored a little bit more, or maybe if we could see if we can get someone to come in and speak about what they do, what they offer. Just a thought. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, I'm also thinking SBA may be a good source. I know Antonio had to drop off, um, but he may also be a, a good um, person to be thinking about this particular one mm -hmm. from the SBA yes. perspective. Yep. I, I, maybe we should have we should have saved it for him if he comes back. Gosh darn it! It just you know we're in murky waters here as we yeah. think about new applications in sustainability. So how do we help clear up that water? And and I think we're talking about bringing in knowledge that that maybe hasn't been developed as yet. So I think definitely talking with these technical assistance providers and SBA is useful, but I think it may also be useful to talk with EPA directly about how what they've learned through these different grants that they have been putting forward, you know, the potential impact that they have and applicability to this space. I've spoken with Kristen about this too, and she's interested, she's also, got a lot on her plate, but I see this area. And one of the reasons why it hasn't been picked up by any one committee is it like it intersects with all three. Yeah. <laughs> so figuring out who's going to be the leader of this conversation is, is a bit more difficult, but it's, a, <laughs> it's an issue that just keeps coming up time and again about technical assistance and how do we learn. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Okay, so let's. I think this one goes into the need need to continue to think about it and, and incorporate it, and hopefully have conversations with Antonio and others. To see how we can make this. Somebody can own this. Somebody needs to own this because we can't all forget about it. Uh, number six: a self certification program applicable to firms that allows them to label their good or service as green. So there's a. a Road and there's probably multiple states, but the Rhode Island Department of en Environmental Management Green Certification Program is the only one I came across uh, where firms essentially fill out an application uh, and they make certain there are industry industry specific applications and certifications they need to make that they then submit and then they get allowed to use 
certain labels. I'm a green hotel. Uh, this is a green event. I am a green golf course. This is a green restaurant and this is green cleaning. Uh, I, I, I like the concept. There's no contractual or procurement advantage that I'm aware of in Rhode Island. The program really is purely for kind of consumer. Uh, you get a, a label to help you market yourself to consumers, but conceptually, there's a there's a step, a leap. I think we could take, or someone could take, is if we were able to, if firms as opposed to solutions and products were able to label themselves as they are in some categories, something, green something, I'm a green service company, I'm a green architect, engineer, construction, something. And then there was some benefit conferred upon that in federal contracting. Uh, that, I mean, that would be a, that would be a great place to go. But I, I know this is a little out there, but I, I wanted to put no, it in front of this group anyway. Not out there. We have a lot of data about this. Go ahead, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of what our my program as far as EPA has recommended eco labels and standards is you know, we take the out of the universe of the eco labels and standards, which is slightly di different from this, and decide which ones are kind of meet the threshold to where, the, where we recommend they're used in federal procurement. And so we have about uh, 40 eco labels and standards that are recommended, and then those are supposed to be. You know, incorporated to the maximum extent possible uh, into into procurement. Uh, but I know that there are a lot of state programs and our pollution prevention grant does have some grants have some overlaps with some of those programs, but I've just the little little caution about how that how tying that how to tie that in with with GSA, um, so maybe Nicole has has. I'm going to be bolder. Any I'm going to well. be a lot bolder. <laughs> I've studied these things from for 20 <laughs> years. 20 years I've studied these things, and these mm -hmm. self certifications are just yeah. right after greenwashing. Absolutely right. right. I think the self cert type part. Yeah, yeah. we we mm -hmm. step into this with noble ideas and expectations, but but in end, it actually creates a lot of noise in the marketplace because. Inevitably, what happens is you end up with these competing labels, one advanced through the voluntary approach and then the other with a more robust one. And, and the reality is the people making decisions can't tell the difference between the two. Um, and the company gets the same credit for the higher standard or the lower standard. So I, I, would, I would advocate strongly that we think about the role of third party certified standards. It's absolutely important to raise the floor and to think about how creating pathways for organizations that are trying to get up this ladder towards third party certification. But I think third party certification should be the gold standard that we're working towards. Yeah, and Nicole, and that's that's the path that the team is on right now, yeah. actually. That's at um, GSA Advantage and uh, Green Products Compilation. I mean, but not just that, but the whole thing. Yes. So that, is that is the path that they're on right now. And that's what we heard so early on. Steve was very critical of the, the self-verification clause right. that is on the, I think that was on the environmental aisle, and that is going to be removed. So so yeah. I would say let's keep moving forward. <laughs> and I think it has been removed. I don't know. It, okay. It, it, I haven't it may, or, may already be in the past, but yeah, I think that. But yeah. I'm not not certain on that. Yeah. Yeah, we we've done empirical studies on the robustness of these types of of labels versus the ones that government puts forward versus other types of labels. And there's a clear distinction in how they're constructed and what the environmental, the subsequent sustainability impacts will be. Great. Okay. Good answer. Good answer. Let's yeah. move on. We'll, I think we'll the self-certification part was definitely the part that, that stood out there. But yeah. but I also want yeah. to thank you, Luke, for putting together all of this. Uh, <laughs> this information. Yes. Yes. So that's a what well, we can. I'm glad. I'm glad we have a clear red though. I, we can pull that one off the list. Uh, it makes it easier. Uh, so concept, establishing a framework for evaluating a firm. Uh, I, I, I know we have all talked about this and, and we've kind of been kicking around like how, 
how do you evaluate a firm? Uh, how do you evaluate a solution? How do you establish a framework for vendor evaluations? And believe it or not, others are struggling with this as well. Um, and so I think there is part of this is an acknowledgement of data, right? What what's what's the baseline? How do we get folks to perform? What is the baseline first? How do we get people to perform better than the baseline? And then how do we evaluate them if they're performing less or at, or how do we give them points if they're above the baseline? And so there was some discussion with Massachusetts about an exercise they're going through and a, and a questionnaire um, where they're kind of trying to take a snapshot now of their vendors, their uh, I think I think they're only piloting it at this point, but a, a certain snapshot about their green practices, policies, their capabilities, so that they can try to develop a framework for vendor evaluations. Now, I I I don't know if there is anyone else, and maybe maybe some of you folks do, who are more sophisticated or have answered these questions already, or have figured out a way how to build kind of RFP criteria that looks at a vendor and can award points based on things that are, you know, both credible and, and objective. Um, but that there, there was a, I think there is a, there was a sentiment here that this would be something they would also be loving. They would love to see yeah. the federal government doing so that they could model it after the federal government. So this is another example. So I would refer to them as vendor scorecards or supplier scorecards. And, um, a lot of local governments, state governments are doing this independently right now, and there's not a lot of transparency and we should be learning from each other. This is a really important example of where I say some of these granting opportunities could be put into play. So if it, imagine if uh, GSA has a, a suite of burning areas where it wants to gather information. In my case, I put together a student team that did this for the city of Tempe. And they worked for six months and they developed us and and I let me dig that up. Let me see what they found. I think it was for local governments. I just worry that may not be as um, and sophisticated is not the right word. There's just less complexity at the local level than there is at the federal level. Um, but you could imagine how developing a vendor scorecard at the federal level could be used across many, many different spaces. And by virtue of creating transparency in what the expectations are, it helps the vendor community fully understand what they need to live up to, right? There are um, incredible spillover benefits of doing this. Um, so uh, if, 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 if there's will to move forward on this topic, I'll go back and look at what my student teams did. I think they spoke with 18 or 20 different um, local governments to find out how they were constructing their vendor scorecards and what was contained in them. Uh, I would love to take mm -hmm. that and make this uh, a recommendation. And I think it would be, I mean, this was something, this was one of the original post-its we were kicking around at the beginning uh, <laughs> that didn't, it didn't make it here, but I think it is, it is a, it is a perfect topic for the GSA. Go ahead, Boris, you were going to say something? Yeah, so I got a couple of thoughts to share. Number one, I believe it was either Oasis or Alliance when they came to talk to us a while back that they were looking at building some uh, criteria to help bring the uh, sustainability piece into their source selection. So they, I think they those two contracts, stuff, and I think it was either Oasis, maybe it was Oasis Plus, uh, where they were looking at that. So that the, I think this would be a helpful area to GSA, honestly. Uh, the, the other thing I was going to say is the recommendations from acquisition workforce on building capacity. I, I really feel like they fit here because this is yeah. about having people at the government that know yes. what to look for. And when you're providing data that deals with sustainability, climate risk, if you have professionals on the government side that know what to do with that data, uh, because that was something we heard from the Oasis program manager yeah. that, you know, we're going to be asked, but she was saying, we're going to be asking for this data, but I'm concerned that we just don't have the bandwidth to really digest this data and know what's good, what's medium, what's not good. Uh, so I think the recommendations you all already put together and you're going to do some updates to that help address this. Uh, but I do agree, this is something I think will be helpful because 
they're kind of trying it out in some of the big contract vehicles. Uh, but I feel like it's it's right. But that those are my thoughts. Just from, yeah. from a GSA so putting my GSA hat on. The reality is we don't need to state explicitly what's in there, but we can provide some examples to help imagine yeah. what it would look like. Yeah. And then, you know, a team can be assembled internally to figure this out. It's it's simply a right. recommendation. Luke, I think it's a terrific recommendation. Yeah. I'm pretty sure pretty it was always, always is plus. Uh, and that's that's been out in the market. And I don't know how far they are, but they're, they're probably doing source selection as we speak. <laughs> Nicole just gave me an A in her class. I'm thrilled right now. <laughs> Professor uh, Darnell, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great, good. So that I think that with additional data, better examples, the benefit of the work that Nicole's students have done, that could be I, that would be great to put as much of that in front of the GSA as we could and see and see what they want us to do with it. Uh, number eight, create a framework for public reporting. It makes the case for green procurement and green action. This is a, I know I've, I probably have shared it with all of you guys already, the, the Minnesota sustainability website, and that you can, you can click on the link. I think that's a link. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible. And it is, they, they have, you know, they have things split up to different categories cost avoided co2 emissions i mean it's it is broken down and 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 they have yeah and they set goals and they track their progress and yes they probably made a bunch of leaps about data and in kpis for success that we may not make or that i may not make in my own job as the port authority of new york and new jersey but they went and they did it and this is like a it it to me this is just a very persuasive case for taking action achieving results translating those results into both greenhouse gas emissions and to cost savings which is you know criticism number 1 of taking any of these actions and so i i you know if nothing else i wanted to make sure we gave them a, a hat tip today because i really do think this is this is really amazing and it would be fantastic if the federal government was able to break this down you know these their 70 million of cost savings could be you know 700 million if it was on, on the federal level so no uh, well, massachusetts does something similar and do uh, they? Okay, yeah when great. i was talking i was talking with uh Julia Wolf about this. I don't think they they broadcast it externally. They have like an internal dashboard, a Tableau dashboard. And she talked about from a change management point of view, how self-reinforcing this is and how it motivates her team to continue to do good work, getting using Jenny's words, it it, it helps, it helps. Uh, reinforce stewardship internally, and it helps decision makers then be able to broadcast the findings to further instill um, the culture of change that they're hoping to move forward. Um, so I think it's an amazing thing. Mark, I think you were going to jump in. Is New Mexico yeah, doing you. this? Thank you, Nicole. And, and board, it, I, I agree too with uh, this is just an amazing start point. It's not a finish point, but the fact that somebody had the guts to do it, I really admire it. Yeah, what, I agree. I agree. One of the things that I'm wondering, because when we were talking with um, with our focus group um, on the uh, related to tech tools and the technologies that presently exist, where you can actually measure, um, you know, we can track what's getting purchased on the environmental aisle and we can track what's happening within SF tool. But as we were talking with the experts in that, in that focus group meeting, we kept hearing over and over again, the caution related to the fact that the data behind what's there uh, was something that they, they didn't wanna put a stake in the ground on. They wanted to sort out data, known data issues first before they start publicly reporting where this is going to go. Um, however, I think there's a subpart to one of our recommendations, Luke, that I should get to you because we talk about how the data is the 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 first uh, is the first step in the right direction. But once the data issue gets sorted out, in our recommendation, we're talking about how 
it's really vital to train people on how to use these tools, right? Because things aren't going to get purchased unless they have the appropriate training on the existing tools that can help them make the purchases, then that get tracked. It seems like this is another dot in that path uh, to, uh, what's the phrase? You, 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 um, you, you monitor what you measure. Is that right? I always confuse, wow. I always reverse it. You monitor what you measure. And if, if we know that it's getting measured and getting reported out, then you can start building the internal incentives for individuals, not at the, not at the, um, not at the ground level, but at more at the executive level, establishing goals and expectations around green spend and the like. So I'm sorry, I'm rambling. I see enormous connectivity between this and uh, the recommendation that we're pushing forward. Can and, and I've already said it before. Can I send that to you, and then we can talk about? Yeah, possible for things? sure. Okay. Yep. Great. Good. And a reminder for me, I made a note there. I believe there is a sustainability scorecard either at the OMB or the CEQ level. I'm not sure, but one of those. And I'll I'll do some research to see if I can find that because I remember talking about that early on. Awesome. All right, great. Um, and finally, uh, concept nine: create an office of enterprise sustainability. Um, so when we met with the state of Minnesota, uh, they really attributed a lot of their success to creating a, an office of enterprise sustainability. Some folks that really ded are dedicated to these issues full time. Uh, is this, Boris and Stephanie, the kind of thing that you think might make sense? And if so, can we nominate the both of you again to lead that office as well? <laughs> So, so full disclosure, I, I actually brought this one down here, and the, I mean, this is we're not taking EPA's job away here, not, no, no, no intent there. But the idea is GSA has been doing a lot with shared services over the last, I would say, the last five years or so, with a couple administrations, and just the idea when when I heard these people talk about how they're looking at sustainability, what what impressed me was they're really doing an integrated approach, you know, whereas we have. So we have chief sustainability officers at every uh, agency. So there is such a organization already. And I know this, uh, the White House has a chief sustainability officer, Andrew Mayock, uh, who basically kind of sets the, the stage for the federal space. But this is really about shared services. Uh, is this an opportunity here? And, and, and I don't know, Jenny, maybe this goes into your lane of thinking this from an enterprise level, because your agency really is thinking about this stuff you know day in day out but i don't know if those conversations have come along on your side because shared services is when we have maybe one agency could you know hold this and offer it to other agencies or whether there will be a team within each agency so it's a it's a bit of a murky area but just talking to this group at um, minnesota just kind of sparked the idea and I, I love the name of the organization office of enterprise sustainability i think that that's a that's a thought. So it's kind of a random thought, uh, and I know GSA likes to talk about shared services because it's one of the things in the mission of the organization to to do your stuff. But I don't know, spark some ideas, Jenny. I don't know if you, you have some thoughts when you see something like this. I want to run it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> You're tired. The first important step, find a leader. <laughs> no, I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as Boris would notice or noted the you know, CQ and Andrew Mayock have that, that role as federal uh, sustainability officer, but, and each agency does, but I guess maybe just defining exactly what it is that GSA what within that realm is is where GSA is really be leading but mm -hmm. Nicole you look like you have yeah I mean from a change management point of view I think it's essential I just mm -hmm. do this is how, this is where you're able to centralize your goals establish a, a vision 
uh, help think critically about how you shift the culture. So a lot of the things that, that we're undertaking within the Federal Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee, ultimately at the point our gap fact gets decommissioned or whatever you wanna call <laughs> the, the transition point, these tasks could be taken on within this Office of Sustainability. Um, I, I think one of our great worries, mine and Anne, is at the point we, we cycle off, I mean, we're providing recommendations from the outside. Where are these, where's the knowledge getting centralized internally, right? So it's important to have individuals and specialists embedded throughout, but it's also important to have a coordinating uh, um, hub up above that's setting the strategy for the organization. Otherwise, it's a, bund it's a suite of one-off activities, right, With without an overarching strategy of how it moves forward. And this could be embedded somewhere else within an organization. But as someone who studies these organizations, if it gets embedded under, so I'll give you an example. Arizona State University uh, is hugely invested in sustainability, but the sustainability office is embedded under business and finance. It's a really weird place to, to sit. So it, 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 it reports to business and finance. My opinion is it should report directly to the president of the university. This is an individual that should have a seat at the table if we're really serious about shifting culture. Um, ASU has figured out, they've managed how to do this, but but the research that I've looked at suggests that it's absolutely essential to have that direct, uh, that direct ear of leaders at the top in order to create change. And that's how individuals lower down in the organization know that this is a priority. Yeah, and, and again, I think as Jenny said, the, uh, the CEQ has that position. The, uh the chief sustainability officer for the federal government. So I think there's some of that work is, and we talked to uh, Katie Newhouse uh, a couple of times and she came and spoke with us. So she's in that space uh, right now. But where, where I was talking here is like, for example, there there are shared service providers. We have one at the treasury that does financial management. So we're setting that up so that they kind of run the systems and processes that affect the whole federal government. We have one at GSA that does uh, like the, the rulemaking process. So, and that, I'm kind of involved in that piece of it that on my day job, where we have rulemaking systems that every federal agency uses and manage. So this is sort of like you centralize the actual work of, of um, a certain function. And if you look at sustainability management as a shared service or a, a centralized office, uh, where you can put resources, systems, and that kind of thing. That, so that was the idea. But I think we can leverage what's already there. And this is maybe a, a conversation with uh, Katie Newhouse again and, and see what's what's going on in, in, that, in that space. Anyhow, my thoughts. Sure. Great thoughts. Thank you, Boris. Uh, and thank you all. And that, that number nine is our, our last tally so far. Um, I think we're... I, th I I really look forward to like another wave of conversations. There's some states out there we haven't reached out to that have supposedly done some cool stuff, uh, including California. So uh, can't wait to to come up with another list and ref refine what's left of this one uh, to turn it into some sort of report that the GSA can can comment on. Um, <clears throat> So I think that is, those are the only two, I will conclude this part, Boris, you don't need to leave this on the on the screen anymore. Uh, that'll conclude the discussion of the two task groups that are at least uh, present in here today. Uh, I look forward to regrouping with the, the group at our administrative meeting on November 9th and maybe tackling the other, the other two. Uh, in the meantime, we'll circulate whatever is put together uh, in advance, if we can. Um, I don't have anything else, Boris. You want to? Yep. Yeah. Be, before leaving this topic, uh, the toxicity task group, uh, neither uh, Kimberly nor David were able to join today, but I'm excited on the, the working meeting. Uh, and then just to let you know, Kimberly has done quite a bit of work. And excuse me, Anish. Yeah. Uh, Kimberly and Anish have done quite a bit of work already in putting something together. Uh, we have meetings with GSA experts um, 
for both from PBS, uh, Public Building Service, and FAST. Uh, and we had Adina, so I feel like they, they've got a good path uh, to something that will be useful for GSA. And then one thing we established is we don't want to get an EPA's lane, OSHA lane. So there, there are some things that are already pre-established for toxicity. So we talked a lot about how to, how to stay away from what's already established. And then is there anything that could be helpful for GSA? So Kimberly and uh, Anish, I feel like have a good handle on what's needed. Uh, to pull together. Kimberly was having some computer issues. I think she had to recreate the, the document that she had already worked on. Yeah. Uh, but just uh, for the group to know that that's, that's coming along nicely with uh, Kimberly and Anish. And, and yes, then having exactly. had already some discussion with uh, GSA experts uh, in this area. Yep. Thank you, Boris. Um, do you want to see if there's any I guess there are no members of the public here today. No, well, we have Cassius. Uh, Cassius, you've been hearing us uh, talk about all, all these things. So, but uh, an opportunity for you to chime in if you any anything you want to share. Good to see Certainly. you. Thank you, Boris. No, I just wanted to say to the committee, thank you for all of the detailed work uh, because this is a lot of work that a, a lot of the, the public and people just see the results of. But it's good to see that all the details and the work come together. And looking forward to us coming together on November 9th. So thank you again for your work. Troy had to leave just briefly. She had another meeting, but she also sent her regards as well too. And I also wanted to thank you for the work. So that's it, I appreciate it. Thank you uh, uh, very much. And back to you, Boris. Okay. Ashes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, Luke, do you have anything else? No, no, final words. Uh, only uh, you know, eat your Wheaties, drink your coffee. We're, uh, we're in the fourth quarter final inning you know whatever it is this is it we're gearing up for uh december 5th so i think we'll we should be meeting all the task groups should be meeting at least once a week um and you know looking forward to seeing all you folks on november 9th all right anyone I, else I, final thoughts um yes. yeah, i ahead, i think I think I mentioned this once before, but I, I will not be able to attend the December 5th meeting. I have another engagement that I had committed to a while ago that I just confirmed is happening. So I'm very sad that I won't be there. But And I have a few minutes now, Luke, if you or if anyone from the task group wants to check in about uh, an administrative way on, on PFAS. Um, or we can just go about our business is also, it's also yeah. fine. Yeah, it looks like Rich is gone, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, he had to go. And I guess oh. David isn't here either. Oh. Okay. Yep. okay. But right, thank Steph you, Luke, for your leadership. Yeah, thank you absolutely. all, really. Stephanie, do you have anything? I do not. And and just listening to today's discussion, uh, I, I, instead of saying something, I think I, I need to prepare something to, to kind of capture what I caught here today. And so okay. I think I'm going to work on that. So okay. just remember this, remember this. Uh oh, I see the wheels turning. <laughs> That's so, good. That's good. That's good. Luke's, my follow ups are going to be to go back and dig up that uh, report that my graduate students put together on vendor scorecards. And then I am going to uh, give you access to our draft recommendations that are swirling, sw swirling around right now. So we can have a conversation about how we can create some synergies here based on some of the things that you're thinking about too. Awesome, terrific. Thank you very much. Good, good. And, and I have a couple actions myself as well. I'll send the uh, meeting invite for November 9th happy meeting. Uh, I'll make the connection with our excess property uh, professionals and then also look at the um, sustainability scorecard, which I know is out there. I just haven't looked at it in a while, but um, I think that's all we have then. Perfect. All right. Well, well it, thank you very much. You want to close this out for us? Absolutely. So if nothing else, let's go ahead and adjourn this meeting.